yes, thank you for surviving this long and being here for my talk. Um, I'm a computer scientist, so there will be a precious little um, geoscience, well, none in this talk. So uh, moving ahead, because I know this is a common question um, or rather assumption. Um, I am at the University of Oregon and there's also this thing called Oregon State. And uh, this, there will be a quiz later. Uh, but how do you tell the difference? Uh, this is the University of Oregon, uh, not our stadium, but that's the mascot, that's Donald Duck there. Um, and this is Oregon State. Now, I wasn't being, uh, you know, mean to them. This is one of the first images that, that comes up when you Google up their mascot, so I just use it. Okay, uh, so ducks versus beavers, green versus orange, all that good stuff. Um, so um, acknowledgement for a few funding sources uh, that have generously funded our work. So first I'm gonna talk about performance of software uh, and then I'm gonna move on to what we do about developers. Um, and typically to set up this, um, I don't get to choose the software whose performance we will be optimizing. Uh, this is basically application collaborators, uh, so scientists in other domains who may uh, want uh, to improve the performance of their code and it doesn't have to be massively parallel. It could be running on a single um, workstation, uh, but they want to just uh, have it work faster. And so we uh, have sometimes multi-year uh, collaborations that uh, focus on this. And the goals are usually to figure out uh, what the goal is to, uh, that you want to achieve. I mean, you can't take uh, you know, a code that uh, currently runs um, in, in many hours on a single machine and hope that in a month it's going to be, you know, running in a few seconds on a supercomputer. So uh, the goal, identify the problems then uh, that may be addressed and then uh, eliminate those problems and then relax. Uh, so the performance engineering cycle, as it's uh, called among uh, my uh, CS friends, has a few obvious steps that I'll go over briefly. Uh, but basically, uh, as with anything whose performance you wish to improve, uh, you basically have to measure the current state of things. And then based on those observations, you want to um, create some model of what's going on. And then, uh, because those are all domain codes, uh, typically for me, uh, really understand what's going on means that you have to talk to the scientists about their performance at the moment, and then we need to talk about what we can do, we cannot do. Uh, so I can't tell them, oh yeah, switch to a less accurate method, that will be faster, right, if the accuracy is something they care about. So this, this part here is pretty important here. How do we communicate the results? And then do we understand each other's language? Absolutely not. Um, and uh, so we spend a fair amount of time uh, in that box and then uh, just cycle through eliminating problems one by one. And I will talk about what that means uh, in the last part of this section. So what do I mean about uh, when I say understanding? So when you have a piece of code, you want to um, know how much is possible to improve. So your code already exists, you have written it, you've spent a lot of time on this implementation, and uh, you have maybe even have some architecture in mind that you wish to run on, and then you want to figure out, well, what could I possibly achieve here? Um, and then also, if you want to uh, be able to run on a future architecture, you may want to know in advance uh, how well would you be doing on that new architecture. And then um, when they say architecture, those things matter a lot. Uh, I was originally at the Department of Energy um, Argonne National Lab. So uh, there was a lot of, um, of course, uh, with each new supercomputer, you want to be able in advance to prepare uh, to run on those machines, but even now with new um, Intel uh, Xeon generations and other accelerators coming up, uh, you wish to be prepared for them before they actually come out. And that never happens, by the way. So, uh, but we think about it. Uh, so we do this through modeling and basically we uh, do some through measurement and some through just pen and uh, paper um, mathematical models of performance, uh, which is, you pick something like time, execution time, and now you want to create um, a model for that that helps you uh, characterize some behavior. And then we also use uh, tools 
that look at the code itself to try to build a model of uh, what's going on. And those are, think of them as compiler-like tools uh, that basically suck in the binary or the source code and build a model based on that. Um, so those three things. And the most common one, uh, which is measurement, uh, also known as empirical analysis, uh, what we try to do here, and uh, this is where maybe, I don't know, so let's see a show of hands. How many of you actually care about speeding up any code that you're currently working on? Okay, so there's quite a bit of interest. I should have asked this in the beginning, uh, but that's okay. So uh, this is sort of, uh, there are many, many ways to do this, and they're uh, currently mostly, uh, most of them are pretty painful, but uh, our goal here is to make some sort of uh, uh, streamline the process for people who don't want to learn um, myriad of tools um, that are, you know, uh, kind of steep learning curves. Um, you don't know whether to trust them or not, and so forth. So we're trying to generalize this analysis workflow for as many types of applications as possible, and uh, to collect empirical data. And by that I mean not just timing. So not just oh, you know, this function took seven seconds, that function took five. Uh, but actually look at the memory performance and other aspects. Um, if you're multi-threaded or parallel in other ways, how well is your code parallelized? All those things can be automated. Um, and so that's what we're working on. Uh, at the moment, I can't boast that we have a generic way to do this. It's still, you know, once we establish a collaboration with somebody, we can implement such workflows and they can use them easily. Uh, but that's kind of the grand goal. Uh, we use actually, uh, those are a lot of tools here that I throw around uh, the names of, but we use a lot of Python uh, data analysis tools because there's so many and they're wonderful. And so um, should be pretty um, low learning curve. Um, so we uh, mentioned Tau Commander. You may Google it. It's not that one. Um, instead, there's, I don't know if you can see it, uh, but it's tilecommander.tipparatools.com, which is a tile group, is a big group that's been at the University of Oregon uh, way longer than me, and they're still nice and happy, but now there's this exciting tile commander thing uh, on top of it that lets you actually program your analysis instead of having to click on some stupid Java GUI developed by students. So um, it's really great. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, I just picked one of the projects that we're just uh, collaborating with now, but basically they have a, a medium-sized C++ code. Now the language doesn't matter too much, although for some languages there's more tools than others. Um, and uh, in this particular uh, C++ code that's using um, Intel TBB uh, for parallelism, uh, we want to find out which of their functions uh, scale the, the worst. You know, so. It's a fairly small amount uh, in a, in a uh, Jupyter notebook of code to, to get to this kind of result, right? And so that's going to be the pattern. Um, and uh, this shows uh, this particular map seed hits um, is the worst scaling function. Uh, as we discovered later, it wasn't parallelized at all, which explains why it doesn't scale. And so this is something uh, that we uh, started working on. And then uh, another thing, so that particular function now, we can go and say, well, what the heck is it doing? I mean, yes, you can go read the code, but when the compiler is done with it, what is it really, um, you know, the instruction mix is one way of looking at it. And those are by instruction, we mean the low level assembly level uh, instructions, right? So as you know, memory access is slower than flops. And so, uh, we look at all these branches, those are conditionals. Uh, they impede parallelism, okay? If the compiler or library is trying to run something in parallel, all these conditionals prevent it from doing a great job. Um, there's a lot of memory operations going on. Uh, there's hardly any computing. So this, these two little segments are all the computing there is. So no wonder this doesn't do so well. Uh, it is very memory intensive, it has conditionals. So, so this is, Again, a quick way to get uh, some information about this function. Um, and then, then you can say, well, but I don't know what this memory load store might be great. It might be, the architecture may be doing a great job fetching all my data as I need it, right? Um, then we can check that um, co quite easily again and uh, figure out, uh, oh, here's my level one cache miss. So you can go very deep or not. That's up to the um, developers, but um, looking at, uh, scaling, 
this is threads at the bottom here, right? Uh, you can uh, see what doesn't scale from the point of view of memory and also the conditionals are here. So you can see that, you, you, you know, ideally this should, these should be flat lines. They should not be going up, okay? And when you have the green line going up, uh, which is branch misprediction rate, um, that's not good. So that's not, that's one thing that's limiting your scaling. So this is just uh, ref uh, analysis to tell you what you should be, what problems you should be focusing on. And then there's many, many more that you can't all be included in a talk just to give you a flavor. So um, then based on all the data we collect, we may decide to build a model. So is, for example, this miss rate here, is it actually related to execution time? Does it, does it affect it at all? Yes, no, right? So uh, we could actually check. Um, so we analyze with a little bit of um, uh, linear regression, usually uh, simple enough and works. Um, and then um, more complex models uh, when needed, including some I'll mention later. So this is to predict execution time on an unreasonable number of threads. Like suppose I have in the future a thousand threads, what's gonna happen, right? things like that. Um, and then, uh, or suppose I reduce my miss rate by 50%, how much speed up am I gonna get? Is it worth my time to, you know, redo my data structures, which is a big, big change, right? So the cost of that effort is huge. Um, and then we can evaluate its effect. So static models, those are weird. I don't expect you to relate to them very much, but they're pretty cool. Um, they're still kind of newish, and so maybe not applicable to as many uh, codes as we like yet. Um, suppose you have a simple function that does something. And in this case, it's doing this very simple vector operation here. And this is, uh, apologize for the C++, but it could be done in any language. Uh, because what we do is uh, we just count things at the binary level, so it doesn't matter where it came from. Um, and you're just looking at the instruction mix, except you're not running anything. You're just looking at the generated binary code. So remember the pie chart from a couple of slides back? So we get the same sort of data without running anything. Um, and based on that now, uh, you can try to determine other things. Uh, so here's an example of that same data in a different form. Uh, this is, believe it or not, the instruction mix here, those four values. And uh, the table uh, or the matrix entries represent um, some transition probabilities because you have if statements and for loops and such where you take different paths in your code. Um, and so on. So I'll tell you later what we use this for. So right now it probably looks very obscure and like, what the heck do you do with that? Uh, so hang on to that. Um, okay, because next up is performance optimization. So all this was just a flavor of uh, some of the, I mean, showing some of the flavors of um, analysis we do. The goal is obviously to improve performance. So eventually we have to do that, um, even though it's so much fun playing with data and we don't wanna stop. So uh, performance optimization could be simple, um, but it's not. And the plan is, as I mentioned before, is you figure out the problems, you fix them, you move on. Uh, the reality is pretty nasty. Um, you know, I don't know if you have, you have your own war stories, I'm sure. Uh, but like we had a period of uh, two, three, four years where, you know, Intel just did not let us measure flops, which is, for scientific computing, floating point operations are kind of essential. And so not being able to know how many of them your program actually did was a little bit crippling. And that's why we started those static tools uh, where we look at the binaries and try to estimate those manually. I mean, not manually, but without running. Um, and then uh, NVIDIA, um, of course, you know, I don't have to explain. Um, and then of course the, the thing is, how many of you have a, a, a machine that has um, Intel or AMD CPU in it and an NVIDIA GPU in them, right? So uh, how many tools do you know that uh, work with both these in concert and harmony languages tools? Do you have one? Which one? Oh, <laughs> very good. Yes. Um, from the point of view of developing scientific software, however, it's zero. And if, in fact, I think they'll actively prevent you from, from doing that because they're competing with each other. So um, 
and, and yeah, using those things simultaneously and well, analyzing them simultaneously, optimizing them simultaneously is pretty much a, a no-go um, if you wait for them um, to give you something. So uh, what we end up doing, is, so that's great because that's what, you know, um, why we exist uh, and have cool collaborations with a lot of different scientific uh, domains. So, so I'll just talk about our view of, of my view, I guess, because I tell the students and they do it, um, of what uh, process we follow to optimize software in general. So it's kind of high level. Um, so the first thing we do um, is check whether, uh, you know, you have some time consuming operation that you're doing. Um, instead of blindly going and hacking loops, uh, we actually will talk seriously and they may laugh at us, but we said you really need to be doing this. And sometimes the answer is no. Um, so the first uh, step is to eliminate code that you shouldn't be uh, doing. Um, and so that's pretty obvious. <laughs> but it's funny that, you know, we don't, we didn't always start with that. Uh, the next thing, which is just for the brave, it uh, hardly ever happens in real life, but in some cases it, uh, it does, is that if there's a way to wean people from uh, Fortran or C++ or C or whatever the heck they're using at the moment and they're unhappy with and introduce a higher level notation that expresses what they need and then introduce a code generation, you know, step uh, that you can optimize uh, automatically, that is ideal. And I give an example with MATLAB uh, where you know things like uh, this being, you know, if B happens to be A inverse, you're not going to end up doing any multiplication, right? Uh, if you have that high level knowledge, which if you encode this in C, you know, uh, you'll never detect such a thing and you will be doing an N cube operation here, right? And I don't want to optimize that. Uh, so this is just an extreme example, but it does happen. Uh, so wherever you can encode things uh, in a higher um, lang level language uh, where you could actually employ some um, optimizations at that level, that's, uh, that's ideal. Obviously, there's a huge implementation cost to domain-specific languages, uh, but it may be worth it in the long term because it will give you a sort of a single code base, multiple backends. Very optimized. Okay, so that's for the programming languages. So next, uh, we look at algorithms. And maybe you um, took numerical recipes and coded. That happens every single year. I'm not joking. That somebody I work with would actually uh, needs an eigensolver. And then, yeah, I mean, they either, you know, found one on Math Overflow or whatever, and, or the numerical recipes book, which I wish would be burnt um, for good. And they coded it up, and it's really hard to convince them it's not great. Okay, so you have to do a lot of work to prove that, uh, oh, by the way, uh, you know, they're much better algorithms nowadays than those that people came up with 30 years ago. So, um, so sometimes, though, that's not the case, and there just aren't any. And then you have to think about them. And so we work on uh, new algorithms with people who are interested. This is not a typical scientific computing. It's more... So dynamic graphs, I mean, they can arrive, uh, arise anywhere, but um, and hypergraphs actually um, are used in uh, computational chemistry and such. And uh, we, and biology is heavy on, on graphs. Um, but basically, how do you efficiently compute properties of graphs that actually keep changing? And we sort of shy away from social networks because we don't care. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so this is kind of part of the work we do is instead of just taking some um, sequential uh, graph algorithm that you're very familiar with, this is single source, shortest pass. Uh, we really rethink what it is we're computing, right? And, um, or, and then and static, by that I mean you compute it once and you're done. Here new edges keep coming, new vertices keep coming or are being deleted. How do you do this in parallel? How do you do it fast? Um, and so this just shows some results from something we did recently. Uh, but I am happy to do this for any domain if I'm qualified to think about it. Um, and then sometimes uh, it's not that there isn't an algorithm, so it's the opposite problem, but you have way too many algorithms. Okay, way too many methods available. And this is the case at least uh, for several uh, different areas. But this example is sparse uh, linear system solution, right? Um, there's dozens of methods. 
that are uh, theoretically equivalent. So when we talk about iterative methods, right? Uh, so curl of methods, they are all um, the same complexity uh, theoretically. In practice, though, they converge at very different rates. And for most of them, with preconditioning even, um, you cannot really predict which one would necessarily be the best for your particular problem. And so uh, this is where uh, we, uh, you know, how do we choose? And we've given up on thinking and use machine learning. And so uh, this is a diagram of the complicated machine learning workflow that we use that's completely automatic for um, one of the libraries we work with, Petsy. But, um, the linear system um, is, uh, you know, the matrix is what uh, we compute the properties of. And based on those, and you have to compute them fast and cheaply because that's overhead, uh, we have a machine learning model that uh, then recommends what's over should you use for this particular one, okay? And there's a lot more. Uh, how well does it work? Well, it depends. Um, if you actually train your model with uh, sort of a more limited uh, set of inputs from, say, the same domain, okay? Not the same application, just generic. Um, uh, and by domain, it's not even the science, it's more the numerical method. So if you're doing the same sort of PDE solution, uh, you'll get a better result. Uh, but generally, uh, we've been able, even with a very diverse training data set, uh, get pretty good accuracy over 90%, which means that in um, over 98% of the uh, cases, when this thing recommends use this method, it will be faster than if you didn't use it. So that's the, the outcome here. Um, the speed ups are, uh, we don't even uh, consider the, the case where you fail to solve it completely because speed up is infinity then. Uh, but it's about, uh, you know, it ranges from uh, a few percent to seven uh, fold. And this is for parallel things that can go pretty uh, large scale. Okay, so anything else on this? No? Oh, low-level optimizations. Those I'm going to skip because I know that you want to see the human part, uh, but I'm happy to talk about them later if you want. So there's a lot of uh, details here. Um, so humans, how do we optimize humans? Uh, right now, I think I, we are not there yet. We're not at the optimizing humans. We're still studying the humans, so we're doing the measurement plus analysis of humans part then leading into optimization. Um, we only have data to go on. We don't talk to anyone. So that's one of the, just what we decided to do in this project. Uh, so we don't, uh, not that we don't trust them, we just don't want to um, have to deal with that. And <laughs> we use only available data, which is the code people write. Um, and so revision control system has a lot of metadata as well that, that we use in issue trackers and such. And the fun part, the developer communications via email, mailing lists, or issue discussions. And um, right now we're just studying them, uh, different aspects of this, and I'll show you a few examples. And then maybe come up with some ideas of what to do or what not to do. Um, so what metrics have we considered? This is a partial list. We've had more uh, in the recent um, months, but uh, you can guess, you know, uh, people doing things like commits, number of lines of code, additions, additions, you know, the usual um, topics of discussion when you talk about the natural language part of this and so on. Um, you can compute a whole lot of stuff. So here's a specific example for three projects over uh, the x-axis is depending on the project, uh, but it is at least several years. So it's the whole lifetime of that project. And those are uh, bugs and fixes. So, you know, when you use an issue tracker, you submit a bug report, things happen. Uh, maybe, you hope, eventually it gets fixed, it gets closed. So this is what this is showing. Uh, so this is cumulative bugs and fixes over time. These are just issues, any issues. So community is just saying something um, and then you respond or, not if you're this project. And so this is interesting, right? Because I don't know, with the bugs and fixes, do you think this is how they, I mean, this doesn't look like a normal scenario, right? That you keep opening new bugs, 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 bugs. And then one day, one guy, uh, and we checked, wakes up, and it's a good day, and he fixes them all. So, I mean, I don't know, I'd be a little worried if I was in this project. 
And then there's more reasonable stuff. And here, people are clearly not keeping up in those two. Uh, you know, things are getting, uh, staying open, closing rate is not keeping up. And then uh, you may want to think of, well, maybe they need more people in this project that are dealing with this kind of stuff. So this is, uh, so discussions, focusing on the natural language processing analysis of this. So what are people talking about? And those are three different um, uh, scientific projects. And then they, uh, hot topics of discussion, this is very standard analysis, but basically bugs, obviously. Um, enhancements, bug fixes, documentations, and so on. You can see sort of over time, this is just a snapshot of all the communications. Uh, what do people email about a lot? This is a Petsy mailing list, developer mailing list. And uh, it's a bit complicated. The topics are on the x-axis. The number of emails is on the y-axis and the size of the bubble is how long this conversation lasted. And um, you know, this, this actually is many years. The big red circles is EUs. Um, and so apparently uh, this is strange, Chebyshev estimate. So we haven't labeled all of them obviously, but you can look it up. And configure error is by far the most uh, long lasting uh, discussion topic here. And so uh, bubble charts are not that useful, but they're fun to look at. Um, uh, this is a completely different project and they um, have advice in this one, do not use OpenMP with Clang, lesson learned. All right, and then uh, we did fun stuff like uh, profanity analysis. Now we can do this for any Git project, okay? Um, so we did this for Linux as well as other GitHub open source projects. And um, we do have the actual words and the actual people and what they like the best, but we're not showing this here. Um, however, this is not the profanity words. This is the words in proximity to profane words. So, so those are the things you're cursing about. <laughs> Obviously they do not like fixing things. <laughs> uh, I have no idea who, uh, where's Jeff? Yeah, there's a... Now their vocabulary is very extensive. Uh, now this is Petsy and, and they apparently curse about Petsy the most. So that's, that's very, um, you know, and then some other topics. Um, and the vocabularies are censored, sorry. Um, but those are, this actually shows humans and what words they use the most. And uh, those can be looked up on demand by asking me. Um, <laughs> but what I notice is this is Linux. Uh, and this is, I, I don't remember which uh, project, has a scientific project, but um, those are the words on the outside. So, so there's very many, 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 many curse words that Linux uses and not so many uh, from the PhD. So you need to diversify your vocabulary, I think. Um, then we look at collaborations, uh, and there's two kinds of collaboration graphs that we create. Those are really cool, I think. Um, not enough time to talk about them, but one shows how people were working on the same resources. So the same files that they're being touched by multiple people, if you, if you commit to a file, we draw an edge between you and the file. And so you can actually see uh, in some in some projects, um, I mean, it's hard to visualize, but you can do different analysis on this to show what parts of the code are in danger of being um, un, you know, maintainable because too few people or nobody's touching them or vice versa, people fighting over the same piece of code. Okay, so, and how people work with each other and whether you have one central person, because if they get hit by a bus or a train, I'm not transportation uh, biased, they will, you know, be in trouble. Uh, so here, failed projects, collaboration graphs. So they're a little bit different from the previous ones which were uh, successful, and we're trying to learn from that. Are developers more productive when they're unhappy? Preliminary answer is yes. <laughs> I will not explain this further. You have to wait for the paper. Um, and so um, I think it's very hard to optimize productivity, but what we're making here is the first steps in sort of quantifying as much as possible things that are relevant, we think, for people to make the right choices and optimizing their own work. And so we won't tell them, hey, don't do this or don't do that, but hopefully provide enough information that if time is being wasted, then they would know that as opposed to not knowing it at the moment. And uh, that's basically it. Uh, we consider both the application and hardware performance and definitely uh, like to talk about um, how to improve the human uh, happiness and productivity. So thank you.
Oh, before you ask questions, um, here's the quiz. Um, so which one's which? What is this? Come on, guys. Oh, is that the state? Very good. University of Oregon. Yes, very good. Thank you. Um, I thought that was really thought provoking. <laughs> so maybe we have time for a few questions. Uh, that's exactly what we're trying to determine. We want to, we see it when we play around with them, but we can't quantify it yet. And so we're trying different metrics to exactly uh, that to tell you that there is a specific difference. There's some uh, where you have, yes, a single central node instead of multiple central. So you compute high centrality nodes and you see, oh, there's only one. That's a problem. Uh, things like that. And a lot of, I call them dandelions because they like, uh, very uh, easy to disconnect pieces of the software. Um, if you have a lot of those, that's a problem. Uh, but I've not proven that yet, so we're trying to make that more robust. Yeah. Well, thank you. Right. Oh yeah, with the with the language, um, one thing to qual qualify is I uh, you you uh, typically the the people who have ended up doing this in their domains is um, are desperate and they have uh, they're not going to get anything done um, outside um, of their project necessarily. So the language is developed internally in the cases I'm involved in, I know of. Um, and uh, it, it's not just single project necessarily, but sub community decides that they've had enough and now they're going to do something about it and some even do it without knowing what they're doing they don't even call it a domain language but that's what they end up having um, and most of the longer lasting projects um, have done something like that already um, and it's interesting because that's uh, the, the critical point for many of them is when you end up having to develop two or three versions of your code. So for example, something that runs on CUDA devices and something that runs on CPUs, and now if you add another one and they say, no way, and now we're gonna switch to code generators or libraries. If you can't use libraries, then you don't really have much of a choice, right? So, yeah. Thank you, Boyana. Um, we are a little bit into our break. Sorry. Um, <laughs> which was not your fault at all. Um, but I thought this was a really interesting discussion and um, part of your talk, so I thought it was worth it. Thank uh, you.